so this is creating and managing a virtual classroom. There's a lot to get over, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I wanted to address when looking at how to create a virtual classroom is really focusing on backwards design um, lesson design process. So um, I actually teach in a school where we use the mastery model where students, the majority of their grade is based off of their scores from showing their mastery of the content standards. We have adopted Common Core, so some of the examples I'm going to be showing you today come from that. So basically what you want to do is start with the standards that your state uses currently and um, create your learning objectives. Create your performance task rubric or assessment, whatever the end product and goal is going to be, you're going to start there, hence the name backwards design. Once you realize where the students are going, you can then work backwards to design the lessons to help them be successful on this summative assessment. So I would also ask or, or recommend that you create a pretest and a post-test to help collect data on your students and how they're going. And then you're going to really break down the rubric or basically the end goal to design the lessons based on the skills and the content knowledge that they need to be successful. So basically when you're looking at the mastery um, model, you're looking at possibly providing the pre-assessment, you're giving them very targeted instruction, possibly even some independent practice, especially if you're using the flip model, you're going to have um, quite a lot of application in class where you're coaching the kids through applying what they know. And then from there, you're going to be giving them what we call a proficiency, um, but it, uh, it we run a proficiency model, but other people have called it a mastery model. So basically you are giving them an assessment to show that they are proficient on the standards. And again, I'm going to show you an example in a minute. So um, my example shows you a proficiency rubric. I'm an eighth grade language arts teacher. So um, this particular unit, we were focusing on three separate standards, 8.1, which talks about textual support and um, using using that support, which you're, which you're reading or your analysis. 8.6 is looking at author's purpose and point of view. And then the writing standard here is just the written analysis of, of something that you've been reading. As you see in the rubric, we move from proficient on the standard to mastery and expert. Basically proficient would be like C-level work, mastery would be like B-level work, and then expert would be above and beyond A-level work. We hate assigning, you know, the letter grades to this. That's not necessarily what um, mastery model dictates or says it should be, but, you know, parents and students have a hard time moving beyond um, those basic constructs. So you can see from the rubric, um, we're going to dive a little bit closer here. Um, what we're saying is proficient is that the students have to at least be able to determine the author's point of view and purpose and um, summarize those points with evidence um, in their writing. Mastery, small variation, we're looking that they can do all of the above and then we're looking for more complex structure. And then the expert should be able to do all of those, adding in a bit more academic word choice and also looking at author's credibility. So again, breaking it down a little bit more. Basic construct, they have to be able to identify author's purpose and point of view. And then we're looking for slight variations in sentence structure. And then author's credibility and word choice. Um, to really round out the differences. So basically, as I create the rubric and I think about what the end task is going to look like, I break it down and, and decide, okay, these are the skills that I'm going to need to build into for my students to be successful on this test. So what's next at that point? Well, you need to figure out how to teach those skills, right, for each part of the rubric. So I also am going to recommend that you reflect constantly through the process. Use your data to help guide what you're doing. Um, after they've had, like this is just an example, after my students had a video tutorial on Sophia on citation, I was looking at some of their pieces that they were working on in class, that application in class, and I was noticing that they weren't correctly citing um, and I needed to do some reteaching. Um, one of my favorite things to do, my, my school is in iPad, one-to-one -one iPad school, and I love using quick 10-15 um, minute Nearpod examples where I use student pieces and I ask the kids to interact with the Nearpod um, in different ways. In this case, I actually gave them an example and had them go through and circle the citations. I had them go through and look for where the student was ex correctly identifying author's purpose, that sort of thing. So the formative assessments are really helpful, but in that way that you notice that you're able to know exactly when the kids are ready for their assessment. 
So um, example, for this unit, I did two different articles in class where we walked through my expectations for the close reading and written analysis together. I gave them several so Sophia tutorials, close reading, highlighting and annotating, how to identify author's purpose, how to identify author's point of view, how to do in-text citation, how to identify author's credibility, and then I also, on our LMS, um, our learning management system, which is Schoology, I gave them a pre-test and a post-test on purpose and point of view. And they were very similar in design as far as the questions were concerned, so that I could really use that data to make sure, yes, they did in fact get it. Their scores went way up on the post-test from the pre-test. They understand this material. Then once I felt like they were ready for their actual assessment, I, um, again, like I said, I gave that one formative assessment when I noticed they weren't doing this, the in-text citation correctly. But when they were showing they were ready, I did individually assign um, through our LMS Schoology a leveled lexiled reading to show their knowledge on the standard. So basically what I did was I created um, three different leveled tests, um, three different news articles basically, and then assigned those to different groups of students based on where they currently stood with their Lexile level. Um, and I've noticed by going through this process, I have students that are passing, um, actually even more than passing, getting into those mastery and expert levels on the first try versus, you know, a few years ago, I would have to give second and third tries to try and make sure that all of my students were successful. So I think by being really diligent in how you backwards design and, um, you know, think about how the kids can really be successful, you'll notice that you actually in the end have to do less work on the assessment, which I think is a good thing. Now, as we move to multimedia, because that's truly at the heart of a virtual classroom, you need to use resources that you're really comfortable with. Some of my go-tos um, are Twitter, Google, and Pinterest. Um, I definitely, over the last couple of years, have gravitated even more towards Twitter and Google+, Plus, just because there is a wonderful professional learning network out there to help you. Um, you know, people are already curating resources, so why not go there, build your professional learning network, and have other people help you when you get stumped on your own? There's a couple of blogs that I would definitely recommend. Cyberary Man does a great job at curating that information. Um, Free Technology for Teachers is another great site. Cool Cat Teacher by Vicki Davis is great. And then for those of you um, teaching elementary, Kleinspiration, if you haven't heard about Erin Klein, she is a great inspiration too. Um, just to, to look for new digital resources, multimedia resources. I also am a huge proponent of Edutopia, Edudemic, and MindShift. I just follow them all the time, um, no matter what social network I'm on, whether I just go directly to the site or I follow them in like my Facebook feed or something. Um, those are great websites. Definitely check those out. iTunes U has a wonderful wealth of resources by... Um, especially by the Apple Distinguished Educators. And then EdTech Teacher does a great job at kind of um, giving you an easy way to move through or filter your sources to try and find exactly what you're looking for. Now, some of the important tips and tricks when thinking about multimedia, it really should be very visual. You want to be concise with your information. I, I try and tell my kids, think about, you know, less is more. You don't want to um, do too much as you're going through different pieces. And the other thing is you're not a robot. Uh, I, I have, if, as you're listening to me, I'm sure I've made mistakes here and there. Um, I think that those imperfections make it fun or, or more interesting for the person that's watching the video. So I definitely don't recommend that you script what you're doing. Um, you're a teacher. You know how to go off the cuff, right? So um, in the end, I think that that makes it that much more interesting. So what do you need to know about Sophia? Well, um, just to break down some of the verbiage that, that I use when I'm talking about so Sophia, tutorials are equal to like a daily lesson in your class. A playlist is what I would consider to be like a unit of study. Pathways would be like a whole bunch of course information. So you're moving from one, one unit of study to the next and building really a core content for a specific um, curriculum, basically. Oops. And then finally, the other big word to, to know is the word embed. So that basically means to use a URL or HTML code to place a digital file or web tool into a website, a blog, an LMS, etc. So um, when you're building a tutorial in Sophia, you're going to be embedding lots of different things. This is why I love Sophia so much because 
you can embed several different platforms, several different things all in one spot, and then you give that one link to your kids. So you're actually able to um, collate a lot of different information into one spot. It makes it much easier for the students. So what can you embed on Sophia? Well, text and images, first of all. You can work on adding videos. You can use URLs from Vimeo or YouTube and um, and or upload your own file if you have just a video format on your on your computer. You can actually do screencasts through Sophia. So you can record, a screencast is basically what I'm doing right now. You can record what is ever on your screen. Um, and you can do that through multiple different platforms. I'm using QuickTime on my Mac, but you can use Screencast-O-Matic, you can use the actual Screencast feature on Sophia. So there's lots of different options for you for that. You can upload slideshows, so PowerPoint, Keynotes, etc. You can add audio, so if you just have podcasts, that's good for little ones, right? Since they can't necessarily read, so they can at least listen to what you're saying. PDFs, so you can upload files. And then the HTML code, so you're looking for embed codes here. So you can um, you can embed Prezi's, you can embed um, PDFs. If you're using like a PDF file that you've uploaded to your Google Drive, you can grab an embed code through Google that way and embed it onto Sophia. So there's lots of different things that you can do. What else can Sophia do? Well, you can easily share with students by providing the link to the tutorial or the playlist. You can embed the tutorial or playlist into a web page, blog, or LMS. You can create groups and quizzes. And by creating those groups, you can actually track the data on your students. For instance, the time that they take watching or doing the tutorials and also tracking quiz scores. So there's lots going on here. So as far as tutorials and groups are concerned, when you're creating a group, you can have multiple owners so they can add content. So that could be um, your students. You can actually give your students the right to add content, or you can have other educators create content. So let's say your department might create a group and you can add things together collectively. Um, one thing to think about when creating your tutorials, it's important to create your objectives and to be really clear with your students on how to achieve those goals. Not only do I put them into the tutorial information, but I also usually put them at the beginning of my, my videos or my slideshows so that my kids can see right away at the end of this tutorial, you will be able to do this. So something to think about. All right, I'm going to have one more video down below where we're going to go live into Sophia, and I'm going to show you how to walk through each of the steps um, and the skills that are needed to build an actual tutorial. Your next steps in um, this particular uh, virtual classroom um, playlist is to, in fact, go through and build a tutorial practicing all of these skills. So make sure you watch the next video as I go live um, to do that. Otherwise, you are finished with this particular information. There's a lot going on in this um, creating and managing a virtual classroom. So make sure that you um, feel like you've watched and, and gotten everything that, that you need to. Rewatch if needed. And make sure to watch the next video um, as I walk through all of the live steps. Thanks, guys.